My task this afternoon is to address the subject of the soldier state compact beyond national defence, strictly understood as defence of the continent and its sovereign interests. Can I begin, though, by saying that one of the delights of working here at the Defence Academy is speaking with cadets and midshipmen about why they joined the ADF. Now, putting aside the personal desire for education and professional longing for experience, there is actually usually an element of altruism. They are prepared to defend the nation, its people and property, its values and its interests. The Australian Defence Force defends Australia. That is its primary mandate and that is what they know well, as do most people who frequent our streets. But when I suggest to officer cadets and midshipmen that their first responsibility is to obey the lawful directions of civil authority, whatever their political allegiances or personal preferences, they think I'm trying to be controversial. The notion that they were recruited to give expression to government policy is a discordant one. I've even suggested to one guy he was a public servant and he took great umbrage at that fact. And if you're a public servant, I apologise to you on his behalf. <laughs> Further, they don't usually acknowledge the subsidiary or supplementary roles, if that's what you think they are, clustered around SFA because the organic connections between this activity and preserving Australian sovereignty are somewhat opaque. We don't connect up cause and consequence with these things very well at all. In my judgment, there is a paragraph missing from the extant national security story. That paragraph contains the compelling narrative linking these roles to the long-standing compact between the state and the soldier. And the absence of this paragraph, this narrative, is revealed in two laments from soldiers that I hear frequently. First, what are we doing here? They sometimes say it slightly differently to that. And the second thing they say is, I didn't join up for this, and you can finish the rest of the sentence. <laughs> Let me do a straw poll. Have you ever heard anyone saying such things? Thank you very much. And to that person who didn't raise their hand, you should get out more. <laughs> now, these laments become acute and the source of anxiety when danger or discomfort becomes extreme. In essence, the soldier is questioning the purpose of the deployment and how it relates to national defence and whether the tasks they have been assigned are legitimate ADF functions and not tasks best undertaken by another nation or another agency. Now, I think this is a first order issue. The soldier in these instances is being placed in harm's way in situations that are avoidable, or to use my friend John's phrase, they're operations of choice. They're discretionary. They don't have to be there, but they're there and they're being placed in harm's way. Now, one response to this potentially subversive questioning is for governments to better explain why an activity is necessary and why particular units are being deployed. Now, I do understand why governments sometimes fail in this regard. They don't want to disclose their objectives to adversaries. When you say you're going to be out by this period of time, guess what happens? They just wait till you go. It's also the case that governments often don't say outwardly what they're doing because they don't want to give political ammunition to their political opponents at home. But there are, I think, two underlying issues here that deserve closer attention because times have changed and changed rapidly. The first is the need for the historic state soldier compact to be reviewed and recast in the form of a covenant that enunciates clear principles that soldiers can understand. Now, we'd be pleased that the minister understood them, but the soldier also has to understand them if they are the means by which the policy is given expression. The second is the need to revise the dominant narratives undergirding ADF service to make SFA activities in particular more explicable in terms of the overall national security strategy. Both issues are important, I would contend, because they bear upon the possibility of ADF personnel sustaining moral injuries as a consequence of their SFA service. I will define moral injury and substantiate this somewhat bold claim at the end of my presentation. So to part one, 
from compact to covenant. Now, we know the Australian Constitution gives the Commonwealth Government sole responsibility for national defence. And since 1901, Commonwealth governments have sought to defend Australia and its sovereign interests with armed forces consisting principally of volunteers, supplemented in times of crisis by conscripts. And I think there is an unwritten convention based on implicit understandings that have endured for more than a century that such service will be seen in a particular light. Let me rehearse part of that understanding. The first bit is this, the principal focus of uniform service is protecting the people of this country and their property. The second is, a volunteer's willingness to obey government direction will not be exploited for partisan political gain. Third, a volunteer will not unnecessarily be endangered or placed in harm's way. The government won't be reckless with the lives of service people. The fourth, uniformed personnel will be granted immunity from prosecution for the legitimate and mandated use of lethal force in operational settings. Uniformed personnel are entitled to special respect because they are willing to accept hardships on behalf of others. And finally, because armed conflict is unlike any other human activity, uniformed personnel are entitled to special care as a consequence of the things they have been obliged to see, hear and do in the course of their duty. I think these things are the essence of the compact between the people, if you like, and the person who serves. But it goes a bit further. It also touches on the state, in other words, the political authority that, if you like, pays for their recruitment and their maintenance in uniform, and it also is the service to which they belong. I was telling someone earlier when I joined the Navy 37 years ago, my first commanding officer said there are passing enemies and permanent enemies. We said, oh, what are the passing enemies? He said, the Soviet Union. What are the permanent enemies? He said, the army. <laughs> His attitude was that the army could get our funding and they'd continue to want it. And that kind of narrative, if you like, entered into my soul for many years. But I actually thought I had a purple tie on, which would have kind of advertised my allegiances and loyalties. But it is amazing how people's uh, affiliation, sense of belonging, can be more to the service than an acronym that happens to be A, D and F. Come back to that notion perhaps later. But I think it's important to note that a compact is what we have, not a contract or a covenant. Of course, a contract is a statement of expectations and responsibilities. A covenant is a depiction of mutual obligations and objectives. A compact has elements of both, but differs in its origins and outcomes. It evolves from a succession of past practices and matures mainly through mutual goodwill, notwithstanding unclarified assumptions and unspecified aspirations. A compact is not a formal document embodying a binding agreement. There are no enforceable rules or regulations in a compact because respect can't be commanded and goodwill cannot be compelled. The compact, the compact is also symmetrical in the sense that the society is committed to the well-being of the soldier who is drawn from that society. The soldier is committed to the well-being of society from which they themselves are drawn as a citizen. Now, while this compact has provided a workable basis for managing military manpower since Federation, I would contend it is now unable to deal with the increasing complexity of modern international relations and the complicated context in which ADF service is rendered. Because the compact is unwritten, much of it is vague, ambiguous and misunderstood. And this applies to both the place of the ADF within the Australian body politic and also within our wider culture. Duties and rights are not clearly delineated, leading to frustration, resentment and bitterness among uniformed person, personnel who, of course, have more skin in the game in this than anyone else. So I am persuaded that a covenant with its inventory of obligations based on a relationship shaped by notions of identity and destiny, who we are and what we might become, is needed to help make sense of many ADF missions, most specifically SFA, as I've said. 
The British government's decision to have a covenant, I think, is indicative of deep dissatisfaction with political decision-making in the UK since 2001 and the need to move from assumptions and assertions to candour and clarity when it comes to uniform service. And so a tri-service document entitled The Armed Forces Covenant Today and Tomorrow was published in the UK in May of 2011. And it's headed. An enduring covenant between the people of the United Kingdom, Her Majesty's Government, and those who serve or have served in the armed forces of the Crown and their families. Notably, this document distinguishes between the Parliament and the people. The covenant itself is not a legal document, although its principles are enshrined in the Armed Forces Act. It begins by explaining that the whole nation has a moral obligation to those in uniform, though it never explains why it is a moral obligation and it never explains why it's an obligation. It just kind of states it and you're meant to assume it, because somehow behind all of that there must be a backstory that makes sense of all of that. I'm not sure that there is, but who am I to argue with Her Majesty and her government? But the Covenant is a welcome attempt, in my view, to express parliamentary regard and public respect. But among many of my other criticisms of this document, the foremost is it actually starts in the wrong place. It starts with the returning person when it should have started with the deploying person. The document should have been grounded in a statement of the armed forces' place in the body politic, in other words, what the services exist to do and why, and state and, and outline the state's use of the service person, where and when they can be deployed. But the UK Covenant is significant in that it acknowledges a problem, and that problem is the relationship between the society, the state and the soldier needed to be rebuilt, rebuilt, according to the UK Defence Secretary. And a quote from the document itself, the minister observed that the Covenant's principles had not been honoured in recent times and that political accountability needed to be increased. Now, the bulk of the document canvasses social services and healthcare for returning personnel, when in my judgement, the reasons these personnel were deployed are integral to what they make of their deployment and those reasons are crucial for how they come to terms with what they have experienced. In other words, why are we here and why is this work ours to do? Now, in my estimation, the ADF is thoroughly conversant with its obligations. It is the obligations of the government and its instrumentalities, together with the wider community, that need to be made explicit and plain. So I think the notion of a covenant is worthy of consideration in this country. The critical element in my view of our covenant would be a description of when and why and where and how the ADF will be used in the context of national politics, a subject that is entirely absent from the 2016 White Paper, although it is a political document with political aspirations and politics will decide whether it's successful or not, yet it makes no reference to how any government will manage the political agenda necessary to have sufficient political will that when money runs out, the first thing that doesn't get hit is what? Defence funding. I've been looking at white papers for 20, 30 years, and when they begin to talk about managing the political context into which all this happens, and talking about bipartisanship in a way that we can understand, I'll begin to say, yes, they really are comprehensive documents. For instance, it is an expression of political will to deploy the ADF overseas in operations that transcend the immediate defence of Australia and its sovereign interests, such as in peacekeeping, humanitarian aid and trained advice assist missions. It's an exercise of political will to do that. We do it here, but we don't do it there. That needs to be made, in my view, explicit to those who are called upon to do it. If you say there's a moral burden to do this, well, there's a moral burden to do that. Why isn't it a moral burden not to do that? If morality somehow is the basis upon which we justify what we send our people to do. These are deployments of choice. They are discretionary operations. Now, the ADF is currently used for a variety of legitimate political tasks beyond its core remit of continental defence, but there are limits to what it can and should do. 
Now, like poli domestic police forces that are precluded from some tasks to preserve their independence and integrity, the ADF should not undertake some activities on two similar grounds. First, they politicise the ADF or make it appear a servant of partisan interest. And second, these activities involve avoidable risks or unnecessary dangers to servicemen and women. Now, these kinds of concerns could be addressed in a covenant alongside more explicit depictions of the status and standing of TAA missions and clear acknowledgement of the personal hazards associated with them and which cannot be avoided. If we're going to do this, people will be hurt, we need to accept it, and if we are to win, as Richard put to us this morning, that's going to come at a cost. If winning is defined as helping people maintain a sufficient level of security in their country that they don't need us to undergird it. The covenant, I think, would also include a meta-narrative or a big story within which uniformed service is understood by everyone. Let me explain what I mean by that as I come to part two, modernising the meta-narrative. An important part of initial entry training is embracing a meta-narrative, a big story that not only explains the raison d'etre of the Navy, the Army and the Air Force, but which also presents a case for the moral character, you might even see, say, the nobility of uniform service. I can remember when I joined as a 16-year-old, the word nobility was one of the few things that the commanding officer said to me. You, know, you have done a good thing. You have you know, put your hand up to serve the nation. I thought I was running away from a violent alcoholic father in Wollongong. <laughs> but there was something bigger in all of that. And we were led to believe and to understand that there was some inherent nobility in what we were doing. It was worthwhile. It was esteemed and it ought to be esteemed. But, you know, despite the passing of time, the ADF's meaning-making story is still focused almost entirely on two world wars that happened long before I was even born. This story does not foreground modern security strategy, it does not reflect the contemporary experience of armed conflict, and it encourages inaccurate and unhelpful comparisons between the past and the present. The desire to promote a tradition of service esteeming certain values, while good in itself, has shackled both Australian society and the ADF to a highly idealised history that has obscured the evolution of international relations, overlooked the changing dynamics of state sovereignty and passed over modern military tactics. Since 1945, the primary mission of Australian forces has been concentrated on promoting regional security, preventing the escalation of conflict and the proliferation of certain weapons and preserving conditions conducive to overseas trade in places like Korea, Malaya, Singapore, Vietnam, Kuwait, Iraq and Afghanistan. Also over the last 25 years, the ADF has reflected Australia's strong commitment to human dignity, to human dignity in Rwanda, Somalia, Cambodia, Bougainville and East Timor, among other things. So there may have been strategic necessities that led us there, but we also wanted to say that human dignity is important. So much so, we're going to send people into harm's way to affirm it. This is how we want to be seen in the community of nations. Yet. These operations, despite being the norm of the experience of most of us, have not shaped the meta-narrative because of the enduring preoccupation with the Great War and, to a lesser extent, the Second World War, something that our operating partners find rather curious. I'm being polite at that point. Because the meta-narrative is selective of a small size of experience, some parts are relegated to the margins or overlooked entirely. So we frequently hear of forgotten conflicts and contributions. Now, while the Defence White Paper has an overarching strategy, its global and regional outlook is not connected at all, I put it to you, at all, to the story we tell Australians via recruitment and remembrance. It's not connected at all. And they are the occasions when the Australian people are listening most intently when it comes to recruiting and resettlement. The public does not generally realise that the ADF is used to uphold a rules-based international order, to preserve regional stability and to express Australia's self-image in the community of nations. So the public upon which the ADF relies for its recruits and the parliament upon which the ADF relies for its resources does not have a clear sense of the ADF's contemporary role, 
most particularly the value and importance of mentoring and assistance missions as preventing us from getting to situations where wars and conflicts need to be fought. Consequently, these missions do not receive the recognition they deserve, and this has consequences for their conduct and evaluation, and notably for the well-being of those who participate in them. So in the same way that Australians tend to become transfixed at the tactical level rather than the strategic levels of warfare, the extant meta-narrative does not do well at explaining the strategic basis of military action because we are enthralled by stories of individual bravery, courage and commitment. So we have all this nonsense about fighting other people's wars. We hold that over there, but we talk about all these people who most bravely fought other people's wars. There's, to my mind, a disconnect between the two that is corrosive of morale and I think does affect people's outlook. So the millions of dollars that are spent each year depicting the nation's uniform service to the public needs to be tuned to another frequency so that the Australian people have a clear sense of what is being done on their behalf and, just as importantly, why it is being done. TAA missions typify so many of our national aspirations of what we actually aspire to be, and yet they do not feature prominently in the defence narrative, if at all. So whether providing for fisheries protection or training an Afghan battalion, the outcome of such missions can be profound, while we know the national image can be enhanced or tarnished by them. So starting with recruiting and culminating in remembrance, the promotion by the ADF of a new meta-narrative will educate the parliament, the press and the people, and help uniform people to find greater meaning in their service, meaning that can and will be absorbed into a personal, consistent narrative that mainly happens when they're civilians, when they're not surrounded by their colleagues at all. If the ADF says its most significant assets is its people, well, we need to regard people as having inherent worth and therefore make the story we tell about them work for them as well. Finally, because SFA missions are usually politically complex, occasionally personally dangerous and often practically demanding, with progress imperceptible in the short term and success in the long term never assured, there is a distinct possibility that ADF members will question why they were deployed, lament that they didn't join for this kind of work and doubt that the work that they are doing will make any real difference at all. This is where and how a covenant makes a difference and a new narrative I think will help to build resilience. But resilience will be impaired if a soldier sustains a moral injury which is the focus of a project that my centre is also doing, a project funded by VCDF. So we're all familiar with talk of the physical self and the mental self. I think we also need to talk about the moral self, that part of the person where moral reflection, reasoning and decision-making take place. Although my centre's research continues, we believe that moral injury is caused by exposure to or participation in an action that violates an individual's moral code because such an action is inconsistent with the ethical norms by which an individual makes sense of themselves and also the world. Such violation damages the moral self and disrupts its functioning. Now, I want to close with a claim that participation in SFA has the potential to inflict moral injury on deploying personnel. Why? Because SFA missions often have, among other things, a strong moral character and they have acute moral consequences. When those people the ADF seeks to help either resist or resent what is offered, when the assistance provided is used against domestic political enemies or exploited for personal financial gain, or where those assisted seem to prefer the way things were to the way that things might be, reflection on such service can be debilitating. There are few things more demeaning than a heartfelt desire to help, to serve, being manipulated or exploited, and few things more dispiriting than seeing help and service turned into harm. Having heard many ADF personnel engage in F SFA work ask whether their service made a difference in either the short or long term, and to hear them question whether their mission had any point or purpose beyond good intentions and political appeal. I'm alerted to the pressing need for a new approach to depicting ADF service and explaining ADF missions, if only because we seek to prevent the proliferation of moral injury. And this must surely be in everyone's interests. Thank you.
comments and complaints. Just throw it right down there. It's like the Olympic torch, isn't it, really? <laughs> no. Tom, Chris Smith, Army Headquarters. Um, uh, so moral injury and, and the, the whole topic you spoke about is something that interests me a lot. The, and while you were talking, I was reflecting on um, Rwanda, and, and which I have some, some experience, and, I've, and thinking about the Caballo um, massacre. And I reflect on that in talking to a number of the, the veterans of, of that, that, um, and look, I, I apologise, I don't, I don't intend to be critical, but, it, but it, this is something to explore. It, it, one of the, um, there was an order of the day prepared um, when we arrived, it had 10 bullet points. Bullet point number 10 was, there is nothing here worth losing your life over, uh, except for your mate. So, so sort of a, an internal focus, you know, we're here, but... Um, but at the end of the day, wh whatever happens, preservation of yourself and your mate is number one. And then we uh, put soldiers into the, that environment where, um, um, you know, a, a large group of displaced persons were sent in on, a, on the top of a hill, but RPA had surrounded them. For whatever reason, and it could quite easily be an accident and a, and a fearful response by the RPA, but thousands of people um, were killed. And, and at the beginnings of it, our soldiers were exposed to it. The, the order at the time was you are not to use force to protect the displaced persons. Now, we know that for Rwanda veterans, you know, psychological or moral injury has been a problem over the years. And, just, and, and this is something that hasn't really come up for a great deal of discussion, and it's only something I sort of reflect on personally. But I wonder, I often wonder to what extent the the initial order and that flavour of us first, others second, um, and then the particular order around the occasion is a cause for moral injury. And I'd just be interested to see whether you've given this particular case much thought, how it fits into this example, because because I think to some extent that idea has permeated a number of our operations and, and has been a theme about how we operate ever since. And it sort of goes to the heart of other um, presentations earlier on, questions about, um, you know, how many casualties is it worth for a particular um, um, outcome and so on. So, look, I, I apologise, that's a long way of getting to the point, but I'm just wondering about your yes, thoughts. Yes, no, look, it. thank you for it. Um, yes and yes, we have thought about it and we have reflected upon it. You can't help people at some point because they're human beings, not seeing other human beings through the, through the lens of nationality. And so I've heard many people say of many operations, although we have an Australian flag, there's a sense in which they inevitably feel a human bond to people in need. That's what we're like. And if people join the ADF, let me put it to you, they're more susceptible to being moved by human need than perhaps might other groups of undifferentiated people. Therefore, when people in those situations, they think we have let these people down, not Rwandans, not anything else, they're, they're human beings. And both I've heard um, my conversations with both Mark and with Brett, is you feel a bond with these people that goes beyond, I'm here to do a job because our country of origin has sent me to your country in order to help. There are other human beings. And I suppose one of the projects of the 20th, 21st century is breaking down a whole lot of divisions between people because we're seeing as a kind of species there's more that unites than divides. And certainly you wouldn't die for Telstra. And then some people will say, well, maybe you, you shouldn't die for your country if in fact that in dying or not dying for your country means you're guilty of some greater crime over here. Um, so I think it, it inevitable that people will feel the bond with those that they're meant to help and that maybe you're not helping them. And I'm, we're coming to the view on our team that perhaps sins of omission are more telling than sins of commission than saying to people there's nothing worth dying here for. Um, I, I would hope that people wouldn't know that that was one of the dot points uh, that you received when you arrived because everything about that um, makes me recoil as a human being. And look, I wanted to say that it has been a common thing, and, and it has never been brought to the fore, and I just get concerned that it's become almost a dogma and orthodoxy that we might then continue to take it in the future. So anyway, 
Yeah, but I mean, wars armed conflicts are dangerous, and I think we were talking before. Is that if you're going to do it, do it properly, and that also means that people are going to die, and that may include you. Just, just to lead on on, on from that point, um, I take you to point three of your covenant that you read out, where you said that service men and women will not be unnecessarily placed in harm's way. I think that is a very dangerous thing to put in a, into a covenant. Is a soldier who is killed on a feint being placed in an unnecessarily in harm's way because it's not the main effort? If a politician calls a campaign, a war, or an academic, as we've heard throughout today, calls an operation a war of choice, then is that service personnel being put unnecessarily in harm's way? I think this, sorry, I think this gets to a deeper problem, which is what the question's about, is if we as a nation believe we need to deploy a force to achieve a mission, then surely that ceases to be a war of choice or discretionary for the soldier. It is absolutely necessi a necessity for them. And therefore this narrative, this meta-narrative you're talking about, which, is, which has talked about a war of choice all day, is in fact confusing for, for the soldier. Okay, can I pull two things apart? The first one is, when I talked about the compact, it included that line. I didn't say that I'd replicate that line then in a covenant. So I would want to separate the two out. So if you're calling me on that one, because I've confused you, then my apologies, I wouldn't put it in there. And when we talk about wars of choice, you're right to draw a distinction between the government might have a choice, but the service person doesn't. And if you're drawing my attention to the need for clarity there, I'm with you 100% as well, because the person bidden to do it doesn't actually have a choice, because part of the, the covenant you would want us to preserve is political impartiality, if not political docility. Therefore, you're told to do it, and you don't have a choice. None of us, well, let me generalise, none of us wants a politically participatory ADF. And therefore, um, on the two points you raise, uh, we're in 100% agreement, and my apologies for if I gave the wrong impression. I didn't mean to, but I'm with you on those points. We'll make, make to make this the last one, I think. Uh, and you can tell me apart during afternoon too. Tom, on the, the comment of the, the covenant and having the people, you know, the Australian people wish to know and, and understand our circumstance, I personally don't mind too much the fact that they don't know and understand, because I would never want them to know the full context of war. And so I do what I do out of service to them and I can live with that. The covenant I'm worried about is the one amongst the people in this room, the people who do understand but still choose to prioritise that their service is more important, their service is worth more, has cost more than you someone else's. Army, Navy, Air, Fo Army, Navy, service, Air Force, yep. Australian Defence Organisation, APS, etc. Um, I've, within the last weeks, been involved in conversation with someone who said, yes, but the air task group pilots who are bombing those people in Iraq or who are flying missions over the Yazidi, that is not as dangerous or as important as the role we're doing in ANOA. Now, clearly they're chalk and cheese, but we don't even have an agreement amongst each other about what our covenant should be and how we should relate to our service and our commitment. How would you balance that? before we go more broadly? Um, look, in one sense, I'm, I'm surprised that, that that's what you see or what you've felt. I suppose I can only see life through these pair of eyes, the only two I've got. And I, it would be alien to me to think that what you were doing was less important than someone else. I just don't see things in that way. I can imagine, though, that others do, and people that say maybe in Air Force there are pilots and there's everybody else, and therefore it may be you know, a sort of systemic cultural type thing. But if you felt there was a need within for people not to look at the first thing that someone looks at now, because I, I mean, I joined, you know, January 1979, you've been to Vietnam or nowhere, uh, a couple of Korean War veterans left, and then no one did anything. You know, three drunken Vanuatuans driving through Vila, you know, look, there's a chance of a deployment. Um, that's what it got to. Um, and so I think that, you know, that this, oh, where's he been, where's he been? Um, if that's actually creating in people's minds a a kind of hierarchy of whose service is more valuable. I mean, everyone is, everyone is needed, plainly. How you communicate that, I think, to give you a, a good answer, I'd have to think more about, because I'd have to get a sense of what the problem is and where it came from, that people would esteem each other's people's service differently. 
given that I would have thought that what we're working on is everyone contributes as best that they are able and that internal statements of values and things like that would lead to you know, respect and regard and those kind of things, you know, overcoming that, that, that kind of thing. Um, we might talk in afternoon tea about the specifics of... Do you want to come in on that? Yep. Uh, my name's Luke Carroll. I'm a bit schizophrenic because I belong to lots of different organisations. I'm here today um, from, the, I, from the Army History well. Unit. Right. Um, I was really interested by what you were saying, Tom, and I just thought I'd bring this up because I don't know how many people will know this, but the ADF actually has an in-place covenant of a type already. It's the um, ADF Families Covenant, and it was brought into place in 2009. And uh, obviously, that obviously precedes the Brit Covenant, which I understand um, uh, is multifaceted and in many respects was about community engagement. I could be wrong and that may be some of the Brits may know more than I. But the point that I guess I want to raise is to encourage people not to, not to turn away from notion of a covenant because in the family space, at least, it, it's proven to be extremely useful uh, over the years since 2009, both in communicating uh, with um, ADF families, and that's a, that's a body of people about in excess of 100,000. Uh, and uh, so not only communicating with the families, uh, but also communicating outwardly um, with many other stakeholders in terms of uh, demands upon families and about what the ADF actually does. So um, there, there's more to this than meets the eye. Yes. Y y yes, that's quite right. And I do think that it's unmet expectations or aspirations, you know. So every Anzac Day, we get to the lead up to Anzac Day, I serve my country and now I've been thrown aside, or whatever else it may be. There are those kinds of things. Or people who become the embittered veteran about whatever campaign they went to that they now regarded as being this, that or something else. I remembered someone saying to me that when a certain Governor-General said that you know, Vietnam was a mistake, you know, the Vietnam was a mistake, that's what the, the Governor-General said, um, that that caused them to have a completely different view of their own service. Um, other people have said what happened you know, in April 75 had a different view of their service. So it's, um, it's nuanced, it's variegated. And as you're saying with families, that could be a lead into the kind of thing that we need to look at that Noel has touched on there. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I would have rung the bell against myself, but it's over there and I'm here. Um, it's afternoon tea. Can I also, just as we break for afternoon tea, um, thank General Campbell again for being with us.